everyone, and welcome to Grace Church Online. My name is Erica Cottle, and I am so glad that you are joining us today. If you would take a second and share your name and your favorite thing about fall in the chat, we would love to hear from you. I'll say this about fall, I love all the comfy sweaters. Speaking of fall, we are thrilled to announce our fall session for Women of the Word. It will be a 10-week study of Exodus, learning more about the God of deliverance. We will gather in person on Thursday mornings from 9.30 to 11.30. Childcare will be available, but it is limited. You can register online today. And hey, for our Tuesday night group, we did not forget about you. Tracy and the team are planning and preparing something special to offer you. Stay tuned for more details. As well this fall, we are launching a new sermon series on September 19th. That week, we'll be kicking off our fall small group and Rooted. If you are interested in joining a small group, you can sign up online. And for those interested in Rooted, you can also sign up online. Rooted is a 10-week discipleship program here at Grace that helps us grow closer to Christ and community. Please be aware that with COVID Delta, things may change. We appreciate your flexibility in this season. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I am here to help. Since we are on the topic of things shaking up due to the spike of COVID Delta, we have one change to our Family Life Conference. We as a team felt best to postpone our Family Life Conference to winter. We will have the new date and details out soon. If you have any questions, please reach out to Keith. Thank you for rolling with us. Well, church, here in a bit, we are going to hear from Keith Nelson. Let's pray before we worship and hear the message. Join me as I pray. God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that we have this time together, even if it's online, to worship together and to hear a message from you. I pray, Lord, that we would go closer to you in this season, learn more about you, Father. We thank you so much for your love. In your name we pray, amen. tries to roll over my bones and sorrow comes to steal the joy I hold when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't Stand a chance when I stand in all love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in all love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lies No, I'm not afraid to leave my past behind No, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in all love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. When I'm standing in your love, there's power that can break off every chain. There's power. Resurrection power that can save It's power in your name It's power in your name There's power that can break off every chain There's power that can empty out a grave There's resurrection power that can save power in your name is power in your name is my fear doesn't 
doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Hello. Grace Church and happy Labor Day weekend. If you're listening to this anytime around Sunday, Monday or Tuesday, we're so glad that you're tuning in. So wherever you are, uh, driving in your car, sitting at home, hiding from COVID, whatever you're doing, um, it's really good to, to have you and to be able to connect with you guys through the video. So we're, uh, we're jumping in today, but I, I have been a little bit off the grid for a lot of the summer because um, I had the chance uh, to bring my new son, Caleb, into the world. And um, it, was, it was an incredible couple of weeks where I got to uh, go through this experience with my wife. She was amazing through the whole time. We brought him home. We uh, spent time with family. We attended a wedding together. We developed rhythms of, of faith with our, our two older kids and how do you be big brothers and sister to a new baby and just, just really special, special time together. And then um, at the end of August, after a couple of weeks with family, uh, I plugged back into the world. You know, we came back into the office. I got my Twitter up again and looked around and just what happened? I mean, you guys made a mess of the place while I was gone. I mean, we have masks again and there's earthquakes and stuff. So that's the last time I'm going on vacation. But um, yeah, it's, we're, we're back. We're figuring this out. We're, we're jumping in back again and, and, and dropped our kids off at at school, um, just I think this week was, was the very beginning of, of it on Tuesday. So we got back in rhythms, where's my backpack? Where's my mask? We're, we're going to doing the thing. And as we're dropping our kids off um, on that first day, it was um, one of my favorite parts is, is seeing the, the, the kindergarten families where it's their first kid, their oldest kid going to kindergarten. So my kids know the drill, they go, hey, bye, and they go to class. But the kindergarten parents are lined up like at the fence, like they're at a zoo and they're just, Bye, bye, Timmy, goodbye. Just get, the kids have been gone for five minutes and parents are still there waving. It's just, um, so I'm a bit of an observer. I just sit back and I'm kind of watching these, these families and no, no joke. First, this mom turns around and, and she just holds herself because she clearly just let her oldest go and she's just got tears and she's walking to her car. And about two seconds later, this dad turns around, who's a neighbor of ours, and just turns to a, a general crowd of strangers and goes, freedom! And just power walks off to like go watch college football or something. I don't know, but um, confusing times. I mean, there's all these events going on right now and it's hard to know how to react. And everybody seems to have a, a different take on it, which is why wisdom is so, so important right now. Wisdom is, is one of the keys. And, and that's why we've been in the book of Proverbs is try to just interject wisdom in our lives because a basic tenet, a foundation of the Christian faith as followers of Jesus, we believe that we need help from the outside. We need guidance. We need saving grace from God. We need wisdom from outside ourselves to be able to know how to navigate it. And so that's why we look at Proverbs. That's why we, we turn to the scriptures. And so I titled today, it's a very clever title. You'll, you'll like it a lot. It's, it's Get Wisdom, Get Wisdom. And um, getting wisdom is, uh, it's, it's the call of, of the verse today. We're gonna go through a section in Proverbs 4, 1 through 7. And um, the whole call is just, hey, get wisdom. Just prioritize this idea of gaining wisdom for yourself. So it's a long section. So I'm just gonna read it uh, over you guys. We're not gonna have it up on the screen. So wherever you are, you can pull it up in your Bible, Proverbs chapter four. You can close your eyes, let it wash over you. Unless you're driving, don't close your eyes, right? But, but just take this in and then we'll, uh, we'll dive into it and try to understand it a little bit. Proverbs chapter four, listen, my sons, to a father's instructions, pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teachings. When I was a boy in my father's house, still tender and an only child of my mother, he, my, my father taught me and said, lay hold of my words in your heart. 
Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or swerve from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. And the first thing I, I wanna point out about this verse is that it is a three generation look at wisdom. It is clearly uh, somebody passing on a, a family inheritance, a, a treasured possession in their family from one generation down to the next. This is Solomon talking about growing up in David's house. Solomon, the, the famous king of Israel growing up in David's house, David who wrote the Psalms, David the soldier, David the political refugee, and eventually the beloved king of Israel, that David, David and Goliath. Solomon grew up learning wisdom from his dad, learning the Psalms. And he's turning around years later to his kids, to his sons, to his students, the people he's mentoring. And he's saying, this is something I learned from your grandpa is, is get wisdom, the, the first thing you can do. And so this three generation look, just, just the big observation is that wisdom is not an individual sport. This isn't us on the balance beam of life, seeing if we can figure it out. Wisdom, wisdom is a team thing. It's a part of the squad. It's something we walk out in community with God and other people. So everything I'm saying today is, is supported by scripture, God, and the people around us. It's the idea of how do we collectively get wisdom. So one thing, one thing stood out. One thing stood out from Solomon's time in his house and his, uh, his father, David, taught him, get wisdom get it above all else. So if we really wanna understand the point of this get wisdom, we're gonna focus in on Proverbs 4, 7. This, this verse that says, wisdom is supreme. Therefore get wisdom, though it costs you all you have, get understanding. It's this idea of the number one priority, the number one thing you can do in life is to get wisdom for yourself. It is the number one back to school supply. It's the number one dating advice. It's the number one thing for travel is to make sure you start with wisdom as a first priority. There's a, there's a story that Jesus tells um, what, 1500 years later or something in the, the gospel of Matthew with Matthew 13, 44. He tells this little story about, about getting wisdom. And he, he says, it's something like this. There's a man who's going along and he comes up to a field and in that field, he finds a treasure and he sees it and just is worth more than his whole life. So he goes and he covers it up because he sees the field is for sale. He goes and he sells everything that he has, all his possessions to come back and buy that field because he sees that something in that field is worth obtaining. It's worth sacrificing everything for. And that is the call to get wisdom. And a, a contemporary story that, um, something that we have celebrated as a culture in this idea is a story of a, a young man named William who, who grew up in Seattle. He was a, a relative unknown, he was just a kid in North Seattle. And he went to Lakeside High School, which was just a few minutes walk from my house when I lived in Seattle. I drove by Lakeside just about every day on the way to work um, where young William went to school. So William, William gets good grades, he uh, grows up, he goes to Harvard University, makes his parents and his community proud. He's Harvard. He's going to be connected to Harvard alumni for the rest of his life and all those connections. He's gonna have the prestige of that diploma, Harvard graduate. But in 1975, William drops out of Harvard because he's gonna go do computer stuff. And in 1975, I mean, that had to sound like just the craziest idea. I'm sure teachers, friends, just what are you doing? And, and, and of course, this was, this was Bill Gates, who in 1975 left college and slept on the floor so he could work 14 hour days and just get up at his computer and learn programming and develop new systems. And today, Microsoft is almost a given. It's in nearly every country in the world as a foundational platform of, of how we work. But Bill Gates knew something in 1975. He saw a preferred future. And even though a Harvard education was right here at his grasp and he was doing well, he said, no, this is better. This is worth giving everything I have to pursue this. And that's what God wants us to do with wisdom is though it costs us everything we have, pursue this future of wisdom with God and to make sacrifices to go for it. So as, as we jump in, something I think is gonna be really important is to understand what is wisdom and then well, how do I get it and what do I do with it? And so that's, that's gonna be our path in, in our time here today is, is figuring out what is wisdom, how do I get it, and then, and then what do I do with it? So we'll go through and we'll do a bit of a, a teaching through the text. 
what is wisdom? Wisdom is knowledge applied. It's taking information that we have and actually using it in, in a way that's helpful for the flourishing of society that benefits our families, our neighborhoods, our world. It's taking what we know and using it in a helpful way. And, and as, we go, as we go through this, it's, um, it, many Christians will tell you that, that telling the truth is important, right? You gotta be honest, but truth is not wisdom. Being honest when it's difficult, speaking the truth in love is wisdom. It's not having character. It's, it's having character when it matters and actually applying it life. It's not teaching your kids kindness. It's modeling servant um, heartedness towards the people around us. It's that actually living out these ideals that we know in the hard day-to-day -day life that we have. So wisdom is knowledge applied. And there's a verse in Proverbs that you almost always have to come back to if you're gonna talk about wisdom because Proverbs starts out with a thesis verse that we've talked about a few times here. And that when, wisdom, uh, when Proverbs talks about wisdom, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And I wanted to come back to it, even though we've hit on it, because this idea of the fear of the Lord is such a hot topic right now. For so many people around the world, so many people in the church, they wonder, is, is the God of Christianity, is, is Jesus somebody who's actually a big scary God? Is he a policeman in the sky just, just waiting to pounce on me and, and get me and send me to hell, right? Is, is, that, is that God's heart? Is that what Christians are about? Is a, is a big universal police? And so we come in and most people say, the fear of the Lord, when we say fear, we don't mean horror movie. Fear is a word that should draw up feelings of reverence, like seeing a giant ocean wave crash. There's a, there's a majesty to it. There's um, like Aslan in the Chronicles of Narnia. If you've ever read that, there's a line in there that says, in Narnia, a thing doesn't have to be good or terrible. It can be both. So the idea that God is this magnificent uh, hugeness in the galaxy is, the, is the, the point there. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But what is, what is the fear of the Lord? And, and Proverbs helps us flush that out deeper that I think is important to push into so we can get a deeper understanding of this God of love. And when we go to Proverbs 8, 13, it's just a few chapters after Proverbs 4. It says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. It says, I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. And so you can read this and go, well, wait a minute, this, this, this God of love, I mean, this, this hate word, I mean, I know families, you're not even allowed to say the word hate. It's a four letter word in their family. So what are you talking about? This God of love hates evil and hates pride and hates arrogance. Well, what we wanna do is come and look at what is the loving response to do if somebody you know is having uh, their life in jeopardy, their soul in jeopardy. And there, there's a story that um, I thought about not sharing, but I think it, I think it illustrates the point pretty well. Um, what does it mean to hate evil, to hate the darkness in the world? And when I was, uh, when I was growing up, I had a, a Nana and a grandpa who lived down in Salem who, I mean, they, they were awesome, loved Nana and grandpa. And they had a house that was full of life. There was ping pong tournaments, there was imagination in the yard, there was dress up games, there was a big backyard with an orchard. I mean, just a house full of life, lots of cousins hung out there. But every couple months we'd go, and I noticed that Nana looked progressively worse and worse through the years. And eventually she wasn't getting out of her chair. She had an oxygen tank and she would sit there and give you a hug. And my parents had to coach me through this part to say, hey, so Nana has lung cancer. Hey, hey, hey the cancer is not going away. Hey, this happens sometimes. This is a part of life, Keith. And I remember hating, just hating that cancer. But if you were to tell me, do you hate your grandma? I go, no, I don't hate my Nana. Like, no, I don't hate Nana. I hate the cancer that's killing my Nana. That's, that's taking the life away from her. And the way that cancer works is you have cells in your body that, that give you life, that are supposed to do a job to keep you going, to help you flourish. But cancer replaces those cells with essentially nothing cells, with worthless cells. And I can't think of a better picture of sin and evil than cancer. When our life, when our vitality, when our freedom in Christ, when our ability to walk forward is hindered by, by pride, by arrogance, by, by perversity, um, 
it takes the life away from us and God looks at it and he hates it. No, he doesn't hate you. God loved the world enough to die for it, but he hates the things that are killing us, this spiritual cancer that we call evil or sin, this separation from our life source. So this, this hatred of evil is, um, is the opposite of the gospel. The gospel is a good news that God wants to give us life and sin and evil takes us away from that. And that's, that's a theme of Proverbs. This way to life, that way to folly. This way to wisdom, this way to tragedy. And as we, as we go through, we can say, okay, great. There's this life out there. There's this life of wisdom. How do I actually get that? What, is, what does that look like for me? I feel like I'm just trying to get up and get my kids to school every day. I'm just trying to figure out dating. I'm just trying to figure out my job. How do I get this life of wisdom? So the Christian faith, it promotes humility because it's so much more about what we are becoming than what we have achieved. It's about what we're being made into. It's about somebody creating goodness in us as opposed to us good, creating goodness ourselves. So a verse that we turn to, to, to understand this or get a great picture of this is in Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two has this, this picture of, it's, it's not what you've achieved, but it's a description of what God is doing in us that grows us in humility and wisdom. For it is God who works. It's God who works. God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. So do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Christianity is about what we become. And so if we wanna talk about how we become people of wisdom, how do we get this wisdom in our life? Um, there's three ways I wanna lay out. That's, that's gonna be the bulk of our time here. And, and the first one is everybody's favorite word. Are you ready? Something everyone loves. Repent. Everyone loves admitting they're wrong, right? So, so this idea of repentance, I wanted to dig into a little bit. We'll start with a Bible verse and I wanna show how repentance is the key foundation block for, for wisdom. And there's a verse where, where Paul in the New Testament lays out these two different paths of, of wisdom. So it's 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not with words of human wisdom, or else the cross of Christ would be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's this idea that the world, the world values strength. The world does not value standing up and going, I was wrong, I need to repent. They don't value that as, as wisdom usually, but in Christianity, we value repentance because we know that that is what plugs us back into our life source. Because we know that we as Christians have fallen away, that we don't measure up. We are, we are not the saviors of the universe, right? We, we have no reason to be arrogant. We have walked away from God and we have become sinful. We have that spiritual cancer in us. And if we want to come back to a life of um, joy and purpose and flourishing, there is one way back. And that is the cross of Jesus Christ because Jesus loved us so much that he laid down his life on that cross. And that whatever spiritual cancer we have inside of us, whatever bitterness and arrogance and prejudice and racism, all those nasty biases that well up inside us, that we don't know what to do with us. We can turn back and without shame, go to God because he made a way on the cross. He offered to take all that sin off of us and put it on the cross and give us his righteousness so we can stand before God with purity. So we can stand before God without shame. There's, there's tons of writing and research on shame right now. Uh, Brene Brown's probably the most famous one where she's talking about a worthy wholehearted person kind of does better, right? The idea of how to get there is that Jesus can take away our shame. So we can stand in front of people without pretending, without needing to put on airs and, and, and act like we have it all together. We can just be who we are and know we're fully accepted in God. And therefore we're fully accepted, period. Repent, come to the God who love you and let him make you holy. Second one is abide. Abide is... Um, it's a word that means to, to be plugged into, to connected. And in John 15, if you haven't read John 15 in a while, in a week or two, just open up, read it again. There's this beautiful section that talks about abiding in God. 
It's this idea that, that God is a vine and we are the branches and we're connected to him. And if you think about, well, how does this help me get wisdom to be connected to God? Well, throughout the Bible, uh, it, it talks about Jesus is the wisdom of God. If, if you look through 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1, I think, it, it actually calls Jesus the wisdom of God. If you look at John 1, verse 1, it says, the word. The word is this, uh, um, this phrase that means the, the logos. The, it means reason, like the reason behind the universe. And it says that, that reason or that wisdom behind the universe is Jesus. So when we plug into Jesus, get the picture of a tree. When you look up and a branch is connected to the tree, you don't say, well, there's the tree, but there's a branch. No, the branch is a part of the tree. It becomes what the tree is. And so in the same way, when we abide in God, when we connect to the God of wisdom and abide in him, we become wisdom ourselves because he makes us new. Now, abiding in God, um, I'm like, great, plants and trees and everything. What is that? How do, do I go stand next to a tree? Um, the, the idea of abiding in God looks different for everybody. It looks different to be filled up by God for, for any number of people. For kids, uh, my kids, they do motions. I mean, they put on worship music and they do the uh, salvation, like they do that. And then they like, you know, they're praying different the next day. Other people, they might put in their earbuds and go on sunrise walks and just, you know, jam out to their hill song and go and feel. Other people just, they do quiet time in scripture and they got a journal and write out their prayers because they can't focus unless they write it down. Other people go get out in nature and, and soak in God that way. But abiding in God and understanding the God of the Bible is the essential way to get wisdom. We repent and then we abide and fill up with his love. And the, the, the last thing we're gonna hit on is living in community, walking in community with other people. Now, I have, I've read a lot of leadership books. I'm a, a bit of an obsessive reader, right? But um, I've never read one main point. I've never read one thesis, one chapter in any leadership or management book ever that said, do you wanna get to the top? Isolate yourself. But if you do let people in, make sure they're yes men or a spouse that really agrees with every single thing you do and doesn't question a thing because other people are bad. But like, no, that's ridiculous. The idea of walking with other people who, who pour into us, who challenge us, who draw us closer to God, that is, that is human wisdom across the board, across culture. But scripture is one of the main forces that really calls us back to living with other people. So there's a verse that I loved at... Um, Church and the world are divided right now. So um, if you want to read what scripture has to say of that, 1 Corinthians, Paul is coming back to a church that's all sorts of different ways. And in the midst of that, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 10, he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. He says, hey, guys, like in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, all of you would agree with one another in what you say and that there would be no divisions among you, but that you would be perfectly united in mind and in thought. And, and Paul's coming to a group of people divided going, hey, can we just come back together? I know there's different teachers. I know there's oppression going on. I know all this stuff's going on, but we've been called to be the church. We've been called to be the body of Christ. We've been called to be a light on the hill that, that other people look at and go, oh, that's how to live. We, we in the church are supposed to be the example to the world. When politics are a mess, when the school districts is a mess, when the parks and rec is a mess, when family is a mess, the church is supposed to be the example of unity and love the exact same way that the Trinity is our example of unity and love. And I got to see just an incredible image of this over the past two years that, that I wanna share just to honor some people in the church. Um, when, uh, two years ago, when my family came out to the church, we started attending, we looked at some different churches and we got here and we went, wow, they preach the Bible on the stage. They love each other. They give generously, they serve. They help. How could we not stay at this church? And they're like, do rooted. And I'm like, what's rooted? So we went, we had no idea what it was, but we jump into this rooted group, which is a 10 week Bible study. And those people, I mean, we went through it together. We dove in, we shared our hearts with one another and we decided, hey, we're gonna roll on and just continue to be a small group going, going forward. Little did we know, right? We're coming up on elections. We're coming up on COVID. We're coming up on all this stuff. But the leadership in our small group was incredible. The leadership in our small group said, you know what? We don't all have the same political views. 
we don't all have the same thoughts on vaccinations and masks. We don't have the same thoughts on how do we parent our kids? What time do they go to bed? We have all sorts of different thoughts on different topics. But the leadership in the group and the people in the group said, we are going to stick together through thick and thin. And we've gone through the past two years. And sometimes it's been dinners. Sometimes it's meeting in the backyard. It was Zoom for eight weeks. It was phone calls. It was prayer walks. It was back together when COVID was over. And now it's back to like, you know, figuring it out. But for two years, this group prioritized loving each other because we all believe in the same God. We believe in a God of love and unity. And throughout scripture, there is a call to, hey, stick with one another. So this is a chance to practice that first point of repentance. So many of us, think of your family, think of your cousins, think of your small group, think of people in your women's and men's ministry these people who God has called us to love and walk with that you've either slowly drifted away from or that you have, um, that you've just had a sharp break with. Repentance looks like coming back and loving people. It's never too late to make things right with God and other people. And God has specifically called the church to love each other and support each other, especially when we disagree, because that's a part of community, because we need each other. We need each other's opinions. So as you have the ability, as much as it depends on you, love and reach out and just go, hey, I'm sorry. Here's what I could have done better. I, I wanna be in relationship with you. I don't know what that looks like, but I know that I wanna be in relationship with you and God. And that, that is a clear call from scripture that I would invite everybody to do because walking in community is one of the primary ways to get wisdom. So to, to close this out, I, I wanted to, to finish out on um, this thought of, well, what do I do if, if I get wisdom? Let's, let's say I, I know what it is, I prioritize it. I, I'm living a life of repentance. I'm abiding, I've got my crew. What, what do I actually do with this repentance? And, and I wanted to um, just share a Jesus story. Just share one Jesus story that I think is a great example to us because Jesus is not just our savior. He's not just our Lord. He is our example of wisdom. He's our wisdom in the flesh. And when we look at him, we can go, okay, that, that's how we get wisdom. That's how we do it. So we wanna look at Jesus throughout his life. And because there's been so much um, uh, difficulty walking with family through the COVID season, I picked a family story of Jesus. Now, Jesus' family, they had an interesting uh, 30 some years together. Um, if you think about how it started, Jesus, um, Jesus was born in a barn to a teenage mother with an adoptive father. I mean, what a way to kick things off, right? So they get started in difficult beginnings and pretty soon after the government is after them trying to kill Jesus. And my baby Caleb was born one month ago. I can't imagine if the government came and was trying to kill my son and I had to get in my car and drive to Mexico and hide out for a year. Like it's hard to wrap my mind around, but that's how Jesus's family began was with trauma and travel and being isolated and being a refugee. And they came through and there's a lot of evidence going through Jesus's life that his father passed away, that, that Mary became a single mom. She became a widow. So you go through all this and you get towards the end and Jesus starts a public ministry. So I know people trying to kill you is tough, but if you've ever been married to somebody in public ministry or tried to do it or been in leadership in a city, um, I mean, uh, it's fun. <laughs> so being Jesus's mom while he's walking around saying, I'm God, right? Or his brothers, um, imagine how much conflict they went through. So all that to say, that whole life to say, when you get to the end of it, when Jesus is at the end of his life on earth, he's on the cross and who is right there within talking distance, his mom. Through thick and thin, he's with mom. And the words that he has for her, he's looking at his good friend, John, and he's looking at his mom and he's saying, John, you take care of my mom. Mom, you're with John now. I can't be, I know you're an aging widow. I can't be there for you, but John can. Jesus walked with family through thick and thin in a way that led them in love where they did not separate. They did not alienate each other, but they went through it together. And then after Jesus dies and, and goes to heaven, um, his, his little brother, James, James, probably one of the people who came to get Jesus when he's like, it's okay, Jesus is like saying he's God. We're gonna like correct him. Um, James eventually comes to the place where he writes a book of the Bible and he becomes a leader in the church in Jerusalem. Now the leadership that 
Jesus had to show and the love he showed for his family through the years is an example to all of us. And I don't know everything he did through the years to stick with it, but a call for us, what do we do with wisdom? My ask is like Jesus, lead your families, lead your families, be there with them, sacrifice for them. We're here in COVID round seven. I don't even know what it is, but we're masking again. Lead your families, don't grow embittered continue to repent and abide in God. Because when things are difficult, when things are hard, that's where leadership is forged. It's when things are tough that we need help, that we need leaders, that we need people step up, need people to continue to abide. This is a time where you earn that trust with your family, that you make that example to your kids. So when your kids and your spouses and your girlfriends grow up, that when those people look back on this time, they go, man, when I think about you, I remember what you were like during COVID. And and let's, let's be those people. Let's let Jesus... Jesus, the wisdom of God. Let's let him fill us up and walk with him this fall. Let's walk with the God of wisdom and make wisdom a first priority, not after school, after sports, after, no, wisdom first, abiding with God first, make him a priority so we can shine like lights in the world and be the light that this world so desperately needs. I can't think of a time where the world needed the church more. I'm gonna read a Bible verse that sums this up and we'll pray out. Matthew 5, 14. You, you Grace Church, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden and neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Let's be people of light in our homes. Father, thank you so much for the wisdom that you've given us and given us the ability to come back to you and abide to you, that we can repent and be filled with your wisdom, that it is obtainable for us, God, no matter what we've done. God, I know there's so much going on out there. There's so much war and, and earthquakes and everything. And, and yet help us, help us go, help us pray, help us give generously, God, all of that. But, but I pray we won't neglect our families in this time as we head back to school, as that stress hits us. God, I pray that we are examples of your love and your leadership the way that you did it in your family, Jesus. God, give us the power to do this. We need your help to go through life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us online today. We would love to connect with you. If you have any questions or would like more information, let us know in the chat or visit gracechurch360.org. Another way to connect with us is on Instagram or Facebook. Grace Church, I hope you have a great day.